Christian Church, United Church of Christ. We are part of a distinct and diverse community of Christians that have come together as one church to join in faith and action. The UCC is a church of firsts, a church of extravagant welcome, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, we want you to know and to feel that you are truly welcome here. We extend a special welcome today to the Oak Park Recorder Society. Music is a huge part of our community life at Pilgrim, and it's a real treat each year when you join us in worship. Today, following the postlude, they will play some Christmas favorites, so feel free to linger a bit longer if you would like. The Christ child has been born. We have come together to celebrate, share the good news, and praise God in community. Thank you for choosing to spend your morning with us. It is a blessing to be here with you. Come. Let us worship our God as one. I would like to invite Bobby Hall, Chair of the Diaconate, and uh, Debbie Kent, our Vice Moderator of the Council, to come forward as we prepare to receive a new member of our congregation. I would like to invite Marcella Richardson. and to come forward to affirm her baptism by uniting with us in this household of faith. Friends in Christ, we are all received through the into the church through the sacrament of baptism. Marcella has found nurture and support in the midst of the family of Christ. Through prayer and participation in our community, she has been led by the Holy Spirit to claim in our presence her covenantal relationship with Christ and the members of the church. Hear the words of Jesus. I am the vine, you are the branches. Anyone who abides in me and I in that person is the one who bears much fruit. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you will and it shall be done for you. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Marcella, do you desire to affirm your baptism into the faith and family of Jesus Christ? I do. 
Do you renounce the powers of evil and desire the freedom of new life in Christ? I do. <coughs> do you profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? I do. Do you promise by the grace of God to be Christ's disciple, to follow, follow in the way of our Savior, to resist oppression and evil, to show love and justice, and to witness to the work and word of Jesus Christ as best as you are able. I promise with the help of God. Do you promise according to the grace given you to grow in the Christian faith and to be a faithful member of the Church of Jesus Christ, celebrating Christ's presence and furthering Christ's mission in all of the world? I do with the help of Today's scripture comes from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 2, verses 13 to 23. Now after they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and went to Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, quote, Out of Egypt I have called my son. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated, and he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had learned from the wise men. Then it was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. Quote, A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because they are no more. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who were seeking the child's life are dead. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there, and after being warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee. There he made his home in a town called Nazareth, so that what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled, quote, he will be called a Nazarene. Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
has been a very busy week. And last week, just a few days ago, I was struck by the abrupt end to Christmas music on one of the radio stations that I listen to regularly, 93.9 Light FM. They promote themselves as playing Chicago's relaxing favorites, which is what they do for most of the year. But starting in November, this year on November 4th, to be exact, they began to play non-stop Christmas music, transforming into Chicago's home for Christmas favorites. <laughs> Murmurings from fans that it seemed a bit too early were met with a response from the station that there's just not enough days in Christmas. We have to get the most out of the short time that we have. Which is why it was a bit of a surprise when I turned it on Thursday morning, the day after Christmas, and all the Christmas music was gone. We were back to relaxing favorites and reminiscing about this year's events as we look forward to the start of 2020. Christmas, the event, was over. Fortunately, that's not the way that we celebrate Christmas at church, although we do have our peculiarities. We officially acknowledge Christmas as a liturgical season, beginning on Christmas Eve and continuing for the next 12 days. A small aside, did you know that the carol, 12 Days of Christmas, is about the 12 days after Christmas, not the 12 days before Christmas? The 12 days of Christmas culminate in the Feast of Epiphany on January 6th. Yet we often tell the Christmas story as if it all happened in one night. Mary and Joseph arrive in Bethlehem, but there's no room available, so they end up staying in a stable. Then Christ is born and laid in a manger, and the angels sing, the shepherds come to worship baby Jesus, and three wise men bring tribute to the newborn king. On the contrary, the writers of the Gospels of Luke and Matthew, the two Gospels that contain birth narratives for Jesus, are clear that this was a series of events that took place over many days. More interesting, however, is that the familiar story of Jesus' birth that we retell each year at Christmas is actually a mashup or combination of the two versions in Luke and Matthew. The writers of both Gospels are in basic agreement on a few key facts, that Jesus was conceived by Mary with no involvement from Joseph, and that Jesus was a descendant of the house of David. But there's significant variation in what details each writer includes, the perspective from which the story is told, and the themes that are repeated for emphasis. That's because Matthew and Luke were written at different points in time for different audiences, and the telling and the retelling of the story was adapted to optimize relevance and inspiration for their particular settings. Now, we've continued to do the same thing over time, adding details that we think will capture the imagination and strengthen the connection of the gospel story for the ancient tale of for the modern listeners. For example, I'm guessing that the Christmas pageant stable at Pilgrim may have been one of the few that included not just cows and sheep, but also chickens. <laughs> Our scripture today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, and for many of us who were raised in the Protestant tradition, it's not a story that we tell often. Perhaps because it's only found in Matthew, not in Luke. Or maybe because scholars have been unable to cooperate Herod's horrific mass murder of the innocent children as historically factual event. Or maybe it's because it's a very unpleasant image, which strikes a little too close to home. After all, just a few days ago, we were celebrating the miraculous and joyous birth of a beautiful new baby boy. Albeit in a stable, he was surrounded by love from both humans and animals. 
All of God's creatures sang praises and worshipped him. Then today we learn that while angels were still singing, King Herod was plotting to kill him, an innocent newborn. And when Herod's initial plan to find and kill baby Jesus did not go as he planned, he doubled down by ordering that all children of the same age be killed, assuming that Jesus would be among them. Why would the Gospel writer introduce so much sadness and hate immediately following the manifestation of God's love in the birth of the Christ child. Actually, from Matthew's perspective, the timing was perfect. Matthew's church saw itself as a messianic community, distinct from all Jew or Gentile, who did not believe in Jesus as the Messiah. Matthew's gospel was written for members of his community to instruct them in their own faith and to clarify it against misunderstandings. It was important for them to understand that Jesus fulfilled the messianic prophecies of the Hebrew scriptures. That Jesus is the king that will fulfill God's promises to Abraham and his descendants. And that God was present and active in Jesus' life even before he was born. God was with Jesus, just as God is with us. So a king is born, but a king is already there, and there's only room for one king. The birth of Jesus, the messianic king, triggers a conflict with the kingship already present in the world. The powerful rarely give up power willingly, and King Herod was no exception. In fact, while it's impossible to prove that the slaughter of the holy innocents occurred as depicted in Matthew, that type of action was in keeping with Herod's character and style of leadership. The conflict drives Jesus from his native Judea into exile in Egypt thus fulfilling what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, out of Egypt I have called my son. The Matthean Christian community was largely Jewish and felt itself to be persecuted by Jewish leadership. And the picture of the Holy Family as displaced persons reflects the experience of some of the Christians in the Matthean church after the 66 to 70 war. Joseph and Mary experience persecution, displacement, and exile because of Jesus, an experience that is painfully familiar to the Matthean community and strengthens their connection to the gospel story because it's their story too. Matthew is tying this moment of Herod's cruelty to all the many moments of loss and despair that God's people have suffered, while at the same time reminding us that in the midst of this, God is acting to save. It seems that Matthew tells this story to remind us that through the incarnation, God enters our own lived reality, including the pain and the suffering and the struggle. And if we are open to listening to and following God's guidance, there is hope for a better tomorrow. Because while today's text is horrifying, we are left in a place of hope because Mary, Joseph, and Jesus are able to return to Nazareth. In a few years, Jesus' ministry will begin and he will continue to threaten and challenge the unjust power structures that prey upon society's most vulnerable, while loving them into health and wholeness as members of God's beloved community. Can you imagine how this story might have been different if Joseph had ignored the angel in his dream and stayed put? Or if Mary had chosen to 
disagree with Joseph and refuse to leave so abruptly for Egypt? What if the wise men had chosen to disobey their dream instead of disobeying King Herod? What if the Egyptians had chosen to treat Jesus, Mary, and Joseph the way the U.S. is currently treating political refugees? They were a young family fleeing their homeland for fear of persecution, dependent on the kindness of strangers. If it were not for the welcoming of the resident community, they would not have survived. We are here in worship today celebrating Christmas and retelling these stories because long ago and far away there were real, ordinary people who chose to listen for and discern the will of God and then act upon it. Of course, there were also people who chose to listen to other voices, voices of fear and hate that called for preemptive violence and attempts to protect their power and the status quo. We live, of course, in settings very different from Herod's. None of us live under royals of great power, though sometimes it might feel like we are indeed powerless when it comes to influencing our leaders. But in reality, we are not powerless. And the good news is that we are not in this mess alone. God is with us. God has not abandoned us to our fate. There are possibilities for acting and speaking up when we see suffering, when we see injustice, when we see cruelty, when we see people, perhaps unconsciously, behaving in ways that make others feel unwanted, unwelcome, less than. Today, December 29th, we are on the cusp of a new year, a new decade even, as with all things new, it's pregnant with exciting possibilities that energize us, inspire us, even move some of us to make New Year's resolutions. When imagining the possibilities for this year and how you would like to focus your energies, I encourage you to carve out time and space to listen for that small, still voice of our still speaking God and let it influence your choices. Because the choices we make, the big ones, the little ones, the seemingly ordinary ones, they matter. With God's help, may we choose and act wisely. Amen. Thank mm -hmm.
continue with the attitude of prayer, we begin today's pastoral prayer with the work of Christmas, a litany composed by Howard Thurman, an African-American theologian, educator, and civil rights leader. When the song of the angels is stilled, when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and princes are home, when the shepherds are back with their flocks, the work of Christmas begins. To find the lost, to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoner, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace among the people, to make music in the heart. Blessed Lord, into our darkness you have brought the light of your love. You have given to us a reminder of the many ways in which you care for us and guide us. This has been a hectic time for so many of us. We have invested ourselves, our energies, and our resources in a flurry of activities, and now we are coming to the end of this calendar year with a new year in view, and we wonder how we are going to have the energy that the new year will demand. Help us place our trust in our lives in your care. As Joseph listened to the angel telling him to follow, help us follow you in all your ways. Give us strength and courage for the times ahead. Let love be the foundation from which all our actions spring. <coughs> Bless and keep us in your care. We ask this in Jesus' name. And now, a little bit um, about Kwanzaa, specifically the Kwanzaa principle of Ujamaa. This refers to cooperative economics, but it comes from, but it comes from the Kiswahili word Ujamaa, which means family. One of the uh, major Kiswahili countries in the world is in is Tanzania in East Africa, which had been ruled and exploited by the Germans and the British for decades, like almost all of Africa, until the early 1960s when Tanzania gained its independence. Once this happened, dozens of ethnic, religious, and cultural groups were now one nation, one independent nation, under the leadership of President Julius Nyerere. The vision of President Inurere and others was that despite their differences, Tanzanians would unite based on a shared identity as Tanzanians, and that Africans would do the same as Africans. Their vision of family transcended race, ethnicity, religion, culture, and political ideology. It also called on the family to work together for the collective economic group. Inurere referred to capitalism as, quote, a fighting system in which the few will sit down to a banquet and the masses will eat whatever is left over. We light this Kwanzaa candle today in the hopes of continuing to work to transcend our differences and become a family that works together for the common good. Yeah. <laughs> 